Section 7 of the Science History of the Universe, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lawrence Trask, Mount Vernon, Ohio, InterfaceAudio.com. The Science History of the Universe, Volume 4, edited by Franz Rolt Wheeler. Chemistry. Chapter 6. The Early Phlogistic Period. Heretofore, the inducements to a study of chemical phenomena had been successively a belief in the possibility of transmutation and a conviction in the potency of heroic medicines prepared in the chemical laboratory but from the middle of the seventeenth century onward another aim is manifest in the works of the masters for from the time of boyle forward the great end of chemistry was recognized as being the discovery of new chemical facts with the object of arriving at the truth alone and thanks to the spirit of true investigation which had begun to extend itself to chemistry and the effect of the inductive method of francis bacon chemistry assumed its proper place as a science as an approach is made to modern times it becomes more difficult to define historically the successive phases of chemistry the learned societies which were founded in the second half of the seventeenth and the beginning of the eighteenth centuries and whose periodicals furnished ever accumulating data for the discussion of old and the initiation of new theories and disseminated the results of chemical investigations in general assisted materially toward the healthy progress of chemical science but nevertheless firm obsequiousness to any one school of scientific thought was not to be expected nor was it found the london royal society was founded by charles the second and was incorporated by him in sixteen sixty two under a royal charter for the improvement of natural knowledge the first volume of the philosophical transactions of that society bears the date sixteen sixty five and ever since its foundation the royal society has been a nucleus around which has clustered the scientific genius of great britain in sixteen sixty six the academy royale was instituted in paris under the protection of louis the sixteenth and its memoirs began to appear in sixteen ninety nine other scientific societies the academia del cemento of florence sixteen fifty seven the academia naturae curiosum of vienna sixteen fifty two and the berlin academy seventeen hundred also brought together those who were in sympathy through their devotion to knowledge and by the interchange of their ideas thought was quickened and the advance of science aided the reciprocal action of chemistry and allied branches of science upon each other was also promoted by bringing together their respective exponents and the discussion of scientific researches helped more thoroughly to sift the evidence on which their conclusions were based and tended to promote increased accuracy and simplicity of thought and expression although the literature of the day bears record of many observations isolated discoveries and discussions on chemical problems yet there was one problem which engrossed the attention of almost all philosophers during the seventeenth and eighteenth centuries and this was the explanation of fire and the phenomena caused by fire notwithstanding the fact that here scarcely any two chemists were agreed in their conclusions their modes of arriving at them showed remarkable similarity little note was taken of the proportions by weight in which substances entered into reaction the qualitative side of phenomena alone was being considered this period of about one hundred and twenty years from boyle to lavoisier may therefore be described as that of qualitative chemistry a step toward the quantitative work of the modern period and an immense step forward from the speculative and fortuitous chemistry of the preceding periods it was a period of generalization for just as fire was to be explained by the assumption of one general principle phlogiston a doctrine which influenced chemists to such an extent 
that this period is characterized as the phlogistic period so the general properties of acidity and causticity were to be viewed as conferred by one fundamental acid and one fundamental alkali respectively and although it was itself handicapped by erroneous views the phlogistic period contributed largely to the refutation of all chemical and iatrochemical errors and was a highly productive period for chemistry robert boyle 1627 to 1691 was the seventh son and fourteenth child of richard earl of cork he was born at lismore in munster at eight years of age he was sent to eton where says he a perusal of quintus curtius conjured up in me that unsatisfied appetite for knowledge that is yet as greedy as when it was first raised after about four years at eton boyle went to his father's seat in dorset and afterward travelled he became a student at geneva and continued his studies at the manor of stalbridge from sixteen forty four to sixteen fifty four when he settled at oxford in sixteen sixty eight boyle moved to london and was a prominent member of the then newly constituted royal society he was elected president in sixteen eighty but refused to serve owing to a scruple he entertained as to taking oaths in sixteen eighty nine his health began to fail and he issued an advertisement restricting the visits of his acquaintances he also had a board put up outside his house announcing when he received visits boyle's health had never been good from the age of twenty-one he suffered from stone and much feared that if it forced him to take to his bed the pain of it would become intolerable he died however without pain and almost without serious illness boyle developed talent early and at twenty-one he had already written on ethics and published several moral and religious essays in sixteen sixty five he published his occasional reflection upon several subjects which procured him the satire of swift in a pious meditation upon broomstick in the style of the honourable mr boyle it would be needless to attempt to go over the whole ground of boyle's work although there is much in it of interest even at the present time as for example his papers on the saltness of the sea and the nature of the sea's bottom and his essay on the intestine motions of the particles of quiescent solids wherein the absolute rest of bodies is called in question he was perhaps the first to draw attention to the desirability of studying the forms of crystals and his papers on the figures of salts contains many curious observations in his experiments about the superficial figures of fluids especially of liquors contiguous to other liquors he breaks ground which has taxed the energies of our greatest mathematicians his treatise on cold abounds with striking and original experiments for example he demonstrates the expansive power of freezing water by bursting a gun barrel filled with water and securely plugged by placing it in a mixture of snow and salt a freezing mixture which he himself introduced in england his essays on the usefulness of experimental natural philosophy were of the greatest service in his time in furthering the cause of science by showing how the material interests of civilization may be prompted by its study and lastly his tract on unsucceeding experiments must have been to quote thorpe as the wine of gladness and the oil of consolation to many a despondent virtuoso boyle was born in the year in which bacon died and boyle's place in the history of science is that of the first true exponent of the baconian period and the skeptical chemist is his greatest work this work probably contains a greater number of well authenticated facts than is to be found in any other chemical treatise of its day but the real merit of this work consists in its determined attack on the authority of the peripatetics and the paracelsians to quote from his own statement in the skeptical chemist to acquaint you with the divers of the conjectures for i must yet call them no more 
i had concerning the principles of things purely corporeal for though because i seem not satisfied with the vulgar doctrines either of the peripatetic or the paracelsian schools many of those that know me have thought me wedded to the epicurean hypothesis as others have mistaken me for a helmontian i should tell you that i have sometimes thought it not unfit that to the principles which may be assigned to things as the world is now constituted we should if we consider the great mass of matter as it was whilst the universe was in making add another which may conveniently enough be called architectonic principle or power by which i mean those various determinations and that skilful guidance of the motions of the small parts of the universal matter by the most wise author of things which were necessary at the beginning to turn that confused chaos into this orderly and beautiful world for i confess i cannot well conceive how from matter barely put into motion and then left to itself there could emerge such curious fabrics as the bodies of men and perfect animals and such yet more admirably contrived parcels of matter as the seeds of living creatures boyle is severe upon the affected mysticism of the spagyrists they may be as obscure as they like about their elixir and the rest of their grand arcana yet when they pretend to teach the general principles of natural philosophers this equivocal way of writing is not to be endured for in such speculative inquiries where the naked knowledge of the truth is the thing principally aimed at what he does teach me worth thanks that does not if he can make his notion intelligible to me but by mystical terms and ambiguous phrases darkens what he should clear up and makes me add the trouble of guessing at the sense of what he equivocally expresses to that of learning the truth of what he seems to deliver indeed boyle does not hesitate to say that the reason why the spagyrists wrote so obscurely of the three great principles was according to thorpe that not having clear and distinct notions of them themselves they could not write otherwise than confusedly of what they had confusedly apprehended they could scarcely keep themselves from being confuted but by keeping themselves from being clearly understood home thrusts which must have made many a helmontian wince the effect of such hard hitting is made evident on the most superficial comparison of the general style of chemical treatises immediately preceding boyle's time with those published toward the close of the seventeenth century the skeptical chemist compelled the decline of the doctrine of tria prima and before the close of the century the paracelsians were as much out of date as a phlogiston would be today boyle indeed appeared to incline to the belief that all matter is compounded of one primordial substance in other words that all matters are merely modifications of the materia prima to quote again from his skeptical chemist i consider that if it be as true as it is probable that compounded bodies differ from one another but in the various textures resulting from the bigness shape motion and contrivance of their small parts it will not be irrational to conceive that one and the same parcel of the universal matter may by various alterations and contextures be brought to deserve the name sometimes of a sulfurous and sometimes of a terrene or aqueous body how closely he was in accord with the modern spirit is shown in this remarkable passage i am apt to think that men will never be able to explain the phenomena of nature while they endeavor to deduce them only from the presence and proportions of such or such material ingredients and consider such ingredients or elements as bodies in a state of rest whereas indeed the greatest part of the affections of matter and consequently of the phenomena of nature seem to depend upon the motion and contrivance of the small parts of bodies it was possible for boyle to expose the shortcomings and fallacies of the then prevalent idea of element or principle i mean by elements as those chemists that speak plainest do by their principles 
certain primitive and simple or perfectly unmingled bodies which not being made of any other bodies or of one another are the ingredients of which all those called perfectly mixed bodies are immediately compounded and into which they are ultimately reserved i need not be so absurd as to deny that there are such bodies as earth and water and quicksilver and sulphur but i look upon the earth and water as component parts of the universe or rather of the terrestrial globe not of all mixed bodies this conception of an element gave the term a positive meaning boyle also looked forward to the discovery of a much greater number of elements than was at that time assumed at the same time maintaining that many of the substances then held to be elementary were not really so boyle was the first to state clearly that a chemical compound results from the combination of two constituents and that it has properties entirely different from those of either of its constituents alone he was therefore enabled to draw a sharp distinction between mixtures and chemical compounds and to grasp clearly the main problem of chemistry the investigation of the composition of substances in doing this he had the solid ground of experience and experiment under his feet and could always bring forward evidence for the probability of his views his endeavors to get at the root of the composition of bodies gave an impetus to the analytical chemistry which before his time could hardly be said to exist and we are at the same time indebted to him for fixing the meaning of a chemical reaction boyle appears to have been the first to employ the term analysis in the sense in which it has since been used by chemists also he devoted much attention to the inquiry of the cause of combustion and other similar phenomena and although his attempts at explaining these were not very successful his experiments on the role played by air in combustion aided the later solution of the problem his investigations on air and gases led him in 1660 to the well-known discovery of the law that the volume of a gas varies with the pressure marriott educed this independently in 1677 boyle's writings which were extensively read in his own time are characterized by simplicity of style and clearness of expression they offer as von meyer observes an agreeable contrast to the works of many in the other chemists of his time who sought to hide their deficiencies in clear thought and accurate knowledge by metaphorical and mysterious language in addition to other papers published in the philosophical transactions the following works of his which were brought out both in english and latin are to be particularly mentioned the skeptical chemist chemistus skepticus first published anonymously in sixteen sixty one and afterward in many editions with boyle's name as author tentamina quidam physiologica sixteen sixty one and experimenta et considerations de coloribus sixteen sixty three editions of his complete works were published in london in seventeen hundred seventeen twenty five and seventeen forty four a contemporary of boyle who made important observations on combustion was robert hook sixteen thirty five to seventeen o two hook was born in the isle of wight and was originally intended for the church but he was of a weakly constitution and much subject to headache and owing to these causes the idea was finally abandoned his leanings were first shown in a considerable aptitude as a boy for constructing mechanical toys after his father's death, Dr. Busby took him into his house and supported him at Westminster School. After leaving school, he went to Christ Church, Oxford, and in 1655 he was introduced to the Philosophical Society. Here his talents were speedily discovered, and he was employed to assist first Dr. Willis and then Mr. Boyle. In 1662, 
he was made curator of experiments to the Royal Society, and when this body was established by charter, he was one of the first nominated to fellowship. He obtained several professional posts, and in 1665, he published in folio his Micrographia, or some physiological descriptions of minute bodies made by magnifying glasses, with observations and inquiries thereupon. It was dedicated to Charles the Second. It is usual to state that Hooke anticipated the modern view of the nature of combustion in this treatise, but it will appear from the following extract that whatever value may be assigned to his work, it cannot be claimed that he did more than recognize the part played by the air in the process, while still adhering to the conception of a sulfurous principle, which is lost by the body during combustion. Thus he observes, from the experiment of charring of coals, we may learn that the air in which we live, move, and breathe, and which encompasses very many, and cherishes most bodies it encompasses, that this air is the menstruum, or universal dissolvent, of all sulfurous bodies, that the dissolution of sulfurous bodies is made by a substance inherent, and mixed with the air, that is like, if not the very same, with that which is fixed in saltpetre, which by multitudes of experiments that may be made with saltpetre will, I think, most evidently be demonstrated. The dissolving parts of the air are but few, that is, it seems of the nature of those saline menstruums, or spirits, that have very much phlegm mixed with the spirits, and therefore a small parcel of it is quickly gutted and will dissolve no more. Whereas saltpetre is a menstruum, when melted and red hot, that abounds more with those dissolvent particles, and therefore, as a small quantity of it will dissolve a great sulfurous body, so will the dissolution be very quick and violent. It is observable that as in other solutions, if a copious and quick supply of fresh menstruum, though but weak, be poured on or applied to the dissoluble body, it quickly consumes it, so this menstruum of air, if by bellows or any other such contrivance, it be copiously applied to the shining body, is found to dissolve it as soon, and as violently as the more strong menstruum of melted nitre. The completion of Hooke's theory was effected by John Mayow, who was born in the parish of St. Dunstan, London, in 1645. In 1674, he produced the treatise on which his fame rests. It is entitled Tractatus Quinque Medico Physici Quorum Primus Agit de Sol Nitro et Spiritu Nitro Aereo Secundus de Respiration Tertius de Respiration Fetus in Utero et Ovo Cordis de Motu Musculare et Spiritibus Animalis Ultimus de Rachitide Studio Jo Mayo LLD in Medici Nec non col om amen at University Oxon Soki Exoni, a Thero Sheldoniano, and Dom. Mayo's assumption that atmospheric air contained a substance, the spiritus nitro aeris, also present in saltpetre, which combined with metals when they were caseined, and which sustained respiration and converted venous blood into arterial, was bound to result in the right interpretation of the phenomena of combustion when the observations which had led to it were sufficiently extended. Mayow's early death in 1679 was perhaps the reason why this did not occur, the development of the new chemistry being greatly retarded as a result. Two members of the French Academy became prominent at this period, the Mary and Omberg. Wilhelm Omberg, 1652-1715, was a lawyer, but gave up the practice of his profession to study natural science and medicine. He knew both Boyle and Kunkel, and was a good observer and skillful in carrying out his experiments, but a poor interpreter of the results. He was trammeled by alchemistic views, maintained that substances consisted of mercury, sulfur, and salt, and took little part in establishing the new theories. 
he contributed a large number of papers on chemical, zoological, botanical, and physical subjects to the French Academy. Nicholas Lemery, 1645 to 1715, was especially renowned as a teacher, though he was also a good worker, dealing in the practical rather than the theoretical. His son, Ludwig Lemery, was also a distinguished chemist. The elder Lemery's greatest work was the writing of his textbook of chemistry, Cours de Chimie, 1675, which embraced all that was known of chemistry and endeavored to give a suitable connection between the facts recorded and to systematize them. This was for many years the best textbook on the science and was issued in 32 editions. Thirteen editions appeared during the author's lifetime and a last much changed one was issued by Baron in 1756. Two German contemporaries of Boyle were Johann Kunkel and Johann Joachim Becker. Kunkel was essentially an experimentalist. He was imbued with a belief in the philosopher's stone and regarded mercury as the necessary component of a metal. He was born at Rendsburg in 1630 and died in 1702. He was the son of an alchemist and himself passed much of his life as the employee of sundry German princes, among them the Elector John George of Saxony, the great Elector of Brandenburg, and the Dukes of Laurenburg, in the unsuccessful pursuit of the Philosopher's Stone. Before the second half of the 17th century, the blowpipe had been used neither in chemical analysis nor for working glass. It was Kunkel's task to demonstrate the case in which a metallic calyx might be reduced by heating it on charcoal before the blowpipe, and to institute a more expeditious mode of hermetic sealing than that of inserting the drawn-out neck of flask or other vessel in a hot fire, hitherto in vogue. Kunkel was the first to recognize an analogy between putrefaction and fermentation, and to show how the production of vinegar in the latter process depended on the initial formation of alcohol and avoidance of low temperature or presence of acids. Among his treatises, the following may be mentioned. Offenlich Zutschrift von von Phosphoro Milliburi en Dusen Ducten den Wunderpelulien, 1678. Ars Vitraria Experimentalis, 1689, and Philosophia Chemica Experimentis Confirmata, 1694. Johann Joachim Becker, who was born at Speyer in 1635 and died in London in 1682, worked almost contemporaneously with Kunkel, although more for the theoretical explanation of already observed facts than for the practical side of the subject but in his unsettled life and his inclination toward new schemes he resembled the latter he worked as an alchemist at the courts in mainz munich and vienna but he was too honorable to deceive his patrons and entirely too candid to allow of his remaining long in any one place in theoretical questions as to the composition of substances Becker attempted to revive the old ideas of Paracelsus in another form. In place of mercury, sulphur, and salt, he adopted three earths of which all inorganic, subterrestrial bodies should consist, vis a vis the mercurial, the vitreous, and the combustible, terra pingui. The nature of any material depended on the proportions in which these three fundamental earths were contained in it of a special importance was becker's assumption that when substances were burnt or metals calcined that terra pingui escaped fire dissolves and breaks up all things made of different parts in metals the more volatile part is expelled that is he regarded combustion as a destruction hence he concluded that every combustible substance must in itself contain the cause of combustibility and that a substance incapable of being resolved into others an element cannot burn it was from this conception that stahl's phlogiston theory originated these theoretical views are to be found in becker's first work 
Physica Subterranea, 1669, and in his last, Thesis Chemicae, 1682. His doctrines acquired great celebrity through Stahl, whose work belongs for the most part to the 18th century, on which he conferred a character of its own by his development of the phlogiston theory. End of section 7. Recording by Lawrence Trask, Mount Vernon, Ohio, InterfaceAudio.com. Section 8 of the Science History of the Universe, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sandra Kinzer, Madison, Wisconsin. The Science History of the Universe, Volume 4. Edited by Francis Rolt Wheeler. Chemistry, Chapter 7. The Phlogistic Period Proper, Part 1. One of the most interesting chapters in the history of chemical science is that dealing with the study of the phenomena of combustion and their interpretations. As Freund observes, it lends itself specially well to the purpose of indicating within the scope of not too complicated phenomena how a theory arises, how it is applied, how the conservatism inherent in the human mind is reluctant to give up an accustomed interpretation of nature, even when it no longer answers to the first requirements of a theory that is, when it no longer explains the facts and laws observed in the class of phenomena to which it refers, but how, after all, facts are and always must be strongest, and hence how a theory is finally given up when no longer able to deal with the facts, and how its place is then taken by another better fitted to do so. The effect of heat on matter had from early times been a subject for observation and experiment, which soon led to classification and generalization. It was observed that while some substances are not permanently changed when heated, sand, noble metals, etc., others are, wood, sulfur, base metals, etc., the burning of substances, that is, the occurrence of a permanent change marked by the appearance of flame, great evolution of light and heat, and the remaining behind of ash, naturally arrested attention in the view that substances were combustible in virtue of the common presence in them of fire matter goes back to the time of the Greek philosophers. That the substances left behind when wood is burnt or when metals such as copper and lead are heated were alike called cineres, ashes, bears witness to the fact that even then these two phenomena, outwardly not very similar, the burning of wood and the change produced by heating metals, were already classed together. The name of calces, Latin calx equals lime, for burnt metals, which up to about 1600 was used along with cineres, and after that exclusively, is due to the Arabian alchemists, and suggests an analogy with the burning of chalk, the burnt metal being produced from the metal by the same process as quicklime from chalk, namely by heating. All through the Middle Ages, the idea was retained that what occurs when substances burn with flame, and when metals are changed to calces, is of essentially the same nature, and must therefore be explained by the same cause. For many centuries, sulfur was looked upon as the principle of combustibility, and metals which could be burnt, that is, calcined, owed this to the common presence in them of sulfur. Ubi inis et calor ibi sulfur summed up this view. Becher's terra pinguis had much in common with the fire of the schoolmen and the sulphur of Abertus Magnus and Paracelsus. The scope of the phenomena to which this explanation of combustion applied was extended by Stahl, and the theory of the phenomena of combustion and other analogous processes, which were to be explained by the assumption of the hypothetical phlogiston, was the point round which chemists in general gravitated during the 18th century. Until the appearance of Lavoisier, the phlogiston theory received the assent of most investigators. George Ernst Stahl, born at Ansbach in 1660, devoted himself to the study of medicine and acquired, first at Jena and later on at Halle, to which university he had been called as professor of medicine and chemistry in 1693, the reputation of a distinguished physician and academic teacher. When he was appointed physician to the king in 1716, he removed to Berlin, where he successfully strove for the extension of chemical knowledge until his death in 1734. He investigated chemical problems in the true scientific spirit, himself guided by the ardent desire to discover the truth. He was able to draw around him pupils animated by a similar purpose. The most eminent among the Berlin chemists of the succeeding generation studied under him. 
Even in his own lifetime, the doctrines which he taught, together with a number of valuable detached observations, were widely disseminated by means of his writings, and especially by his lectures, the latter of which were published by several of his pupils. Stahl, however, exercised his greatest influence both upon his contemporaries and upon the succeeding generation by his phlogiston theory, which eclipsed all his other chemical work. Phlogiston was defined by Stahl as materia aut principium ignis, non ipsi ignis, and was conceived to be a very subtle matter, capable of penetrating the most dense substances. It neither burns, nor glows, nor is visible. It is agitated by an igneous motion, inio motu, and it is capable of communicating its motion to material particles apt to receive it. The particles, when endued with this rapid motion, constitute visible fire. The igneous motion is gyratorius su vorticillaris. Heat is an intestine motion of the particles of matter. Phlogiston was a new name for an old principle. We know that the idea of the existence of a subtle fire innate in matter has pervaded physical philosophy from the earliest times. Phlogiston was, as Rodwell notes, another name for the pure fire of Zoroaster, the atechnicon pir of Zeno, the subtilis ignis of Lucretius, the elemental fire, astral fire, sulfur, or sulfurous principle of the chemists, the calor calestis of Cardenas, the sideric sulfur of Paracelsus, the materia calestis of Descartes, and the terra inflammabilis of Becher. The functions of this entity had been varied by different thinkers, almost as much as its name, until Descartes gave them accurate definition. The theory of phlogiston was the theory of the materia calestis extended in a chemical direction. Phlogistic chemistry was Cartesian chemistry. Descartes defined the physical functions of the materia calestis, while Becher and Stahl defined its chemical functions and applied them to the explanation of diverse chemical phenomena. Throughout the writings of Becher and Stahl, we find a sprinkling of Cartesianism. They did not, however, adopt the system in its entirety, but appear to have discarded the second and third elements, and adopted the first as the parent of their own system. The theory of phlogiston was essentially and completely a syncretistic theory. It was built up, as Rodwell observes, of idolotheatry, collected from various sources, and these were cemented together by the particular idolospecos of Becher and Stahl. In this process of syncretism, the merit of these men lay. Their fault was a too hasty generalization. In that stage of chemistry, syncretism was inevitable. Indeed, all theories are more or less tinctured by it, with the exception of those which emanate from a new mode of experimenting, such, for example, as Kirchhoff's theory of the constitution of the sun. A theory proceeds by slow evolution until it dominates or is destroyed, and it was thus with the theory of phlogiston. Arising under the most favorable conditions, it attained full development, became most cardinal, most sovereign, and then fell. For twenty-eight years it was looking a half-formed thing through the mists of chemistry. For thirty-four years it was growing in strength and proclaiming its dynasty. For fifty-four years it was dominant, and it was fully ten years yielding up the ghost. Becher and Stahl were the prophets of a new mode of chemical thought, essentially classificatory, systematic, and syncretistic. In their day, chemistry was at the commencement of a period of transition, and they bridged the gap which existed between empirical chemistry and modern chemistry. They did not collect the materials for the structure. They did not altogether construct it, but they designed it and helped in the work of building. Albeit a bad bridge and built upon shifting sands, yet it was a channel of escape from mystic science, and many passed over to take refuge on the other side. To Stahl, however, belongs the merit of grouping together the phenomena of oxidation and reduction, as we now term these, albeit by the aid of a false hypothesis. The addition of phlogiston is equivalent to reduction and its withdrawal or escape to oxidation. The analogy between respiration and the decomposition of animal matters on the one hand and combustion on the other did not escape Stahl, who likewise assigned the chief role in these processes to phlogiston. The value of his theory lay therefore in the interpretation which it afforded of a variety of processes from one common point of view. The simplicity of this explanation blinded both himself and the generation which followed him to such a degree that they left unnoticed all the glaring contradictions between many actual facts and the phlogistic doctrine. Notwithstanding this, however, the latter was not an obstacle to the development of chemistry, considering that chemists like Black, 
Cavendish, Margraff, Scheele, Bergman, and Priestley, who so greatly extended the science by their wide-reaching discoveries, were phlogistonists in the full sense of the word. Stahl's two most famous contemporaries were Friedrich Hoffmann and Hermann Burhav. Hoffmann, born at Haller in 1660, after acquiring a thorough knowledge of medicine, mathematics, and the natural sciences, practiced first as a physician and then became professor of the science of medicine in Haller, where he ultimately died in 1742, after an interregnum spent in Berlin. His most important work was done in medicine, and in pharmaceutical and analytical chemistry. He combated with success the iatrochemical doctrines of Silvius and Tacanius, which still held their ground with many physicians, exposing their absurdities and showing to what nonsensical deductions such exaggerations led. Hoffman's views on combustion were very similar to those of Stahl. With respect to the calcination of the metals and the reduction of their oxides, however, he expressed opinions which approximate to those held at the present day, believing, as he did, that metallic calces contained a salicidum in addition to a metal the former of which escaped when the calces were reduced. This assumption did away with the similarity between combustion and calcination. These phenomena became indeed rather opposed to one another thereby, and with this the special use of the phlogiston theory vanished. Hoffman was a very voluminous author, and his collected works in six volumes and five supplements, entitled Opera Omnia Physicomedica, 1740-1760, show clearness of style and precision of expression. Melin, in his Geschichte der Chemie, enumerates 122 chemical treatises by Hoffmann. Hermann Borhoff was born at Vorhaut, near Leiden, in 1668, where he received his education and became professor of medicine and afterward of chemistry and botany. The 36 years of his residence there were the most brilliant in the history of this university. Looking at his chemical work alone, he is found distinguished in the main as a teacher and for his skill in interpreting chemical facts and the clearness of his theoretical views. He exposed the errors of the iatrochemists and recognized chemistry as a distinct science. He also showed the falsity of the views held by the alchemists. He spoke only of things tested and observed by himself, and spared neither pains nor time to have his observations correct. For instance, the alchemists maintained that mercury could be fixed in the form of a fireproof metal, without the addition of any other substance. Burhav kept mercury at a somewhat raised temperature in an open vessel for 15 years without noting any change. So, too, when heated higher in a closed vessel for six months, no change could be discovered. This convinced him that the fixing of mercury was an impossibility. The alchemists said also that if mercury was repeatedly distilled, a more volatile essence with peculiar properties could be obtained. Burhav carried out this distillation 500 times without securing the essence. And so he tested other of their peculiar notions and prescribed methods without obtaining the results promised. And as the methods were still credited in some quarters, he did good service in disproving them, and won for himself the reputation of being a most excellent and painstaking worker. His lectures were published first in the surreptitious edition, Institutiones et Experimenta Chemiae, 1724, and afterward corrected by him under the title Elementa Chemiae, 1732. Eleven editions and translations were published in Germany, France, and England. Borhov appears to have concurred in the phlogiston theory in many points. At least he expressed no opinions contrary to Stahl's fundamental views, although he did not agree in regarding the calces of the metals as the earthy elements of these latter. The influence of Stahl's doctrine manifested itself more immediately in Germany, where it received the almost unequivocal support of chemists, Berlin remaining the center point of this theory. Among the men who upheld and endeavored to propagate it, Margraff was the most active. Caspar Newman, born 1683, and Johann Theodor Eller, born 1689, contemporaries of Stahl, were also active adherents of the doctrine in Berlin. Both of them, as professors at the medico chirurgical Institute, were in a high degree active in maintaining and disseminating a knowledge of chemistry. Their own observations were, however, of little importance. Newman made the first accurate observation of the acid obtained from ants, and the views of Eller were chiefly upon subjects of medical physiology, and are full of crude speculations. Stahl's pupil, Johann Heinrich Pott, born 1692, improved chemistry by many valuable observations, but he was unfortunate in his explanation of these. He regarded boracic acid, for instance, 
a substance which he had himself investigated carefully, as consisting of copper vitriol and borax. The results which he achieved were not, as von Meyer notes, at all commensurate with his untiring perseverance, which he showed, among other ways, in his endeavors to prepare porcelain. Although an adherent of the phlogistic doctrine, Pott did not bring forward anything new in its favor. With regard to the nature of phlogiston itself, he could only express the opinion that it was a variety of sulfur. A notable achievement associated with his name was a wide extension of the method of dry analysis. His Chemische Untersuchungen was published in Berlin in three parts in 1757. Newman's pupil, Margraf, was the last of the well-known German chemists of the phlogiston period. Andreas Sigismund Margraf was born at Berlin in 1709 and proved a most able experimenter. Indeed, it is for his many isolated discoveries that he is remembered, rather than for any influence exerted on the general trend of chemical philosophy. One of the most lasting benefits owed to him is the introduction of the microscope as an aid in laboratory work. The occasion was noteworthy. A paper appeared in the memoirs of the Berlin Academy for 1745, in which Margraf stated that small crystals of sugar might be seen with the aid of a microscope upon the finely divided and desiccated roots of the carrot and beetroot. He further stated that this sugar could be extracted by lixiviation with hot alcohol, and added that mere compression of carrot or beet would yield a saccharine liquid, from which the sugar might readily be extracted. These observations remain unnoticed until the continental blockade of France in 1806 urged its people to find some substitute for their imported sugar. Of prime importance was Margraf's observations on phosphoric acid, whose principal physical and chemical properties he accurately described. He obtained this acid by burning ordinary phosphorus in the air and dissolving the resulting fleur de phosphore in water, also by heating phosphorus with concentrated nitric acid. Margraf's work on the composition of gypsum was remarkable. He had noticed that potassium sulfate on heating with charcoal emitted the pungent smell of burning sulfur, and, as this also occurred when gypsum or heavy spar was substituted for the potassium salt, they too must be compounds of sulfuric acid. One should not forget his introduction of potassium ferrocyanide as a reagent for iron, nor his separation of microcosmic salt from urine. He remarked that it was this salt which contained the phosphorus. With great talent for observation, Margraf united the gift of deducing what were generally sound conclusions from his work. In one point, however, Margraf, like all phlogistonists, was not in a position to do this, although he had himself proved that phosphorus increases in weight by conversion into phosphoric acid, he could not free himself from the idea that phlogiston escaped during the process of combustion, and he could never be brought to see that this conception was an erroneous one although the anti-phlogistic doctrine was brought out several years before his death. Margraf's papers are, as mentioned, almost all contained in the memoirs of the Berlin Academy. Most of them were published from 1761 to 1767 in two volumes, under the title Chemische Schriften. A French edition appeared in 1762. In France, the principal exponents of chemistry during the 18th century, until the downfall of the phlogistic system, were Geoffrey, Du Hamel du Monceau, Ruel, and Peter Joseph Macaire. Stephen Francois Geoffroy, the elder, to distinguish him from his less celebrated younger brother Claude Joseph, whose work was chiefly pharmaceutical chemical, was born in Paris in 1672 and helped for some time in his father's apothecary shop. He gave himself up, however, to chemical and medical studies and labored with great success as professor of medicine in the Jardin des Plantes from the year 1712 until his death in 1731. Geoffroy became well known throughout the scientific world by his researches upon chemical affinity, his Table des Rapports, Tables of Affinity, in which the results of his most important observations are collected, exercised a great influence upon the doctrine of affinity. His theoretical views were less idoneous. For example, he looked upon the iron found in the ashes of plants as having been produced artificially during the process of ignition. Geoffroy's views on combustion were in principle those of Stahl, though he expressed himself in the nomenclature of the earlier period, yet there was much promise in his conviction that the different calces were radically different bodies. A real service was rendered by him by the energy with which he attacked alchemistic frauds, subjecting these, as he did, to critical examination in the memoir De Supercherie concernant la pierre philosophale, presented to the French Academy. 
Geoffroy's treatises were published partly in the Memoirs of the French Academy and partly in the Philosophical Transactions. His long-celebrated work, Tractatus de Materia Medica, shows that he regarded chemistry as a sister science and an invaluable aid to medicine. Henri-Louis du Hamel du Monceau, born 1700, died 1781, of the school of Lemery and Geoffroy, spent his life in Paris, where his versatility gained for him a high reputation. His sterling work was not by any means in pure chemistry alone, but also in physics, meteorology, physiology, botany, and particularly in chemistry, as applied to agriculture. Duhamel's great achievement was the differentiation of the two alkalis, soda and potash. The composition of ordinary salt had hitherto eluded research. Stahl, it is true, believed one constituent to be an alkali, and an alkali quite different from potash, if one might judge by differences in the crystalline form and solubilities of their respective salts. There was a vagueness about his work, however, and it had met with little recognition. Duhamel published a paper in 1736 on sea salt, which put the matter beyond question. In it, he first showed that the base of salt was not in earth, for the addition of potash caused no precipitation, then that its several salts all differed essentially from those of potash corresponding. He laid stress, too, on the fact that the further one moves from the sea, the less the quantity of the new base and the greater the quantity of potash in the surrounding vegetation. Subsequently, while describing minutely the differences between the analogous salts of these bases, Duhamel mentioned the yellow and violet colorations which they respectively give to a colorless flame. While Duhamel worked mainly as an academician, Guillaume François Ruel, born 1703, died 1770, was occupied in teaching at the Jardin des Plantes, and some of his pupils, particularly Lavoisier and Proust, attained the highest eminence. At the same time, he was also busy as an investigator, as many admirable observations and conclusions drawn from the latter show. Ruel fixed the meaning of the term salt in the Memoirs of the Academy for 1745 from a far more general point of view than von Helmont or Tacanius had done. The composition of a substance alone was sufficient to tell him whether it belonged to the class of salts or not. Salts were produced by the combination of acids of every kind, with the most various bases, and in addition to neutral salts, he drew a distinction between acid and basic ones. With views so lucid as these, Ruel was far ahead of his contemporaries. Ruel's cours de chimie, according to Uffer, exists only in manuscript. End of section 8. Recording by Sandra Kinzer, Madison, Wisconsin. Section 9 of The Science History of the Universe, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lawrence Trask, Mount Vernon, Ohio, InterfaceAudio.com. The Science History of the Universe, Volume 4. Edited by Francis Rolt Wheeler. Chemistry. Chapter 7. The Phlogistic Period Proper. Part 2. The last of the French chemists of renown to adhere to the phlogistic theory was Pierre Joseph Macaire, who was born at Paris in 1718. He became a member of the French Academy at the age of 27. Excellent opportunity for work was afforded him by his position as professor at the Jardin des Plantes, and his methods of research were more like those of the present. He determined the solubility of various salts in alcohol, and used this as a means of separating them from one another. Some of his researches were on potassium arseniate and on the coloring matter of Berlin blue, the later he identified with phlogiston, because it was destroyed on heating. He was the author of several textbooks, Elements de Chimie Theorique, 1749, and Elements de Chimie Pratique, 1751, which were highly thought of. But his chief work was his Dictionnaire de Chimie, which appeared first in 1766. This was the first dictionary of chemistry and it was enlarged three times and translated into english german italian and danish 
Macaire died in 1784. All his life he remained a phlogistonist, and did all that he could to reconcile the continually augmenting dissidences between theory and facts. He paid no attention to proportions by weight, for it was only in this way that he could maintain the phlogistic hypothesis. And even although it was proved to be erroneous and untenable several years before his death, he was still unable to relinquish it. During the 18th century, many distinguished chemists flourished in Great Britain and Sweden, all of whom were adherents to the phlogiston theory of Stahl, and this notwithstanding the fact that it was their investigations, particularly those of Black, Cavendish, Priestley, Scheele, and Bergman, which destroyed the foundations of this theory. Black was born near Bordeaux in 1728, and died in Edinburgh in 1799. His father, a wine merchant, was originally a native of Belfast, being descended from a Scotch family, which had been settled there for some time. Black's original thesis for his degree was entitled Experiments upon Magnesia Alba, Quicklime, and Other Alkaline Substances. It was published in 1755, and was reprinted in 1777 and 1782. During the ten years he was professor of medicine at the University of Glasgow, he began and made great progress with his well-known researches on the heat of fusion of ice, and the heat of vaporization of water, or as he termed them, the latent heats of water and of steam. The carbonates of the alkaline earths were before Black's time regarded as simple substances, and it was also supposed that when limestone was burnt, fire stuff was taken up, and that this went over into potashes or soda, when these were causticized by means of lime. Black, on the other hand, showed by his investigations that when limestone, carbonate of lime, or magnesia alba, was calcined, something escaped which caused a loss of weight, and which was identical with Van Helmont's gas sylvester. This gas, which he termed fixed air on account of its being held bound by caustic alkalis, lime, etc., he proved to be also present in the mid-alkalis, and these latter became caustic when deprived of their carbonic acid by lime or magnesia. In this research, methods are met with which have the imprint of a new departure, that Black devoted great attention to the proportions by weight of the compounds which entered into the reaction, is seen in all his investigations, and it is thus easy to understand how he gave up the phlogiston theory and concurred in the doctrine of Lavoisier, when the correct explanation of combustion and similar processes became possible through the discovery of oxygen. Cavendish, the distinguished co-worker and fellow countryman of Black, was born at Nice in 1731, two years before Priestley. But notwithstanding his brilliant circumstances, he lived the life of a recluse, devoting himself entirely to the furtherance of his beloved science. He died in 1810. His most important work was the discovery of hydrogen, which he called inflammable air. This he distinguished from the fixed air of black, concluding that this inflammable air was the unaltered phlogiston of the metals. He was the first to attempt to determine the specific gravity of the gases. He showed that lime carbonate was held in solution in water by dissolved fixed air or carbonic acid. He proved in his experiments on air that when hydrogen was burned, water was formed, thus really determining the composition of water, though he did not recognize this fact. This led to a sharp controversy as to the phlogistication of the air of the atmosphere, and in the hands of the great interpreter of results, Lavoisier, did much to clear up and advance chemical theory. The opposition of Cavendish to the anti-phlogistic doctrine, which he helped to found by his own investigations, can only be explained by the fact that he did not take the proportions by weight 
in the processes of combustion into due consideration the opposition of cavendish to the antiphlogistic doctrine which he helped to found by his own investigations can only be explained by the fact that he did not take the proportions by weight in the processes of combustion into due consideration but interpreted the latter in a manner which appeared to him sufficiently convincing viz by regarding hydrogen inflammable air as identical with phlogiston in addition to this cavendish showed a wonderful exactitude in his researches upon gases whose specific gravities and volume ratios in chemical reactions he established with what ingenuity he thought out and carried through physical experiments is well illustrated in his work on the specific heats of metal and in his attempt the first one which was successful to determine the specific gravity of the earth another instance will be fresh in the memory of most readers viz cavendish's suspicion from the results of his own experiments on the combination of oxygen and nitrogen that there was possibly still another gas present in the air in small quantity argon when this marvelous versatility is considered and the thorough mathematical training that cavendish had gone through is remembered the wonder seems great that he had too little stress upon proportions by weight in chemical reactions joseph priestley was born at field heads near leeds in seventeen thirty three and received his education at a public school and at an academy of the dissenters his studies were theological in character and he became a dissenting minister he was not a success in this work becoming extremely unpopular even with his own sect he also conducted a school but was in very needy circumstances he was able however to buy a few books and some instruments including a small air pump an electrical machine etc and was tireless in his work training himself and his scholars in natural science meeting franklin in london he was attracted to the study of electricity and wrote a history of electricity this together with some new experiments on electricity performed by him won some outside reputation and his election as fellow of the royal society he moved to leeds settling near a brewery this gave him opportunity for examining the fixed air discovered by black which had been shown to be one of the products of fermentation he collected this gas from the vats and performed many experiments with it moving away from the brewery he had to prepare the fixed air for himself and this led to his devising the simple and useful pneumatic trough in the heated times of the french revolution his church and dwelling-house were mobbed and burned his library and apparatus destroyed and he himself escaped with difficulty to london and finally took refuge in america where he settled in pennsylvania in this country he pursued his scientific experiments discovering carbon monoxide he died in retirement in the year 1804 one french historian henri Gaudier, states in his essay sur la histoire de la chimie that priestley sought an asylum among the indians and eventually his entire family died by poison priestley was a brilliant investigator performing many most striking experiments he was however neither thorough nor very careful and was lacking in the scientific acumen needed for the proper interpretation of his results it was upon the gases that his most valuable work was done his invention of the pneumatic trough enabling him not only to discover new gases but to investigate the properties of many already partially known he considered that more is owing to what we call chance than to any proper design or preconceived theory in this business and shows how large a share this element of chance had in his discovery of the new gas oxygen his method of experimenting is well illustrated by his own account of his discovery of oxygen seventeen seventy four 
having procured a burning lens i proceeded with great alacrity to examine by the help of it what kind of air a great variety of substances would yield putting them into vessels filled with quicksilver and kept inverted in a basin of the same after a variety of other experiments i endeavoured to extract air from mercurius calcinatus per se and i presently found that by means of this lens air was expelled from it very readily having got about three or four times as much as the bulk of my materials i admitted water to it and found that it was not imbibed by it but what surprised me more than i can well express was that a candle burned in this air with a remarkable vigorous flame i was utterly at a loss how to account for it his experiments showed him that this air had all the properties of common air only in much greater perfection and he called it deflogisticated air regarding it simply as very pure ordinary air in eighteen forty three cuvier endeavoured to show that the french chemist bayon proceeded priestly in the discovery of oxygen bayon however in reducing precipitate per se noted only the metal and entirely disregarded the escaping gas he seems to have looked upon all gases as easily changeable one into the other at least in the first period of his work many experiments were made by him on the action of the various gases known to him upon animals and plants he would place a mouse in the jar of the gas and notice the effect upon its breathing and general life processes plants were grown in similar jars and the results upon the growth noted he showed that air which had become noxious through breathing or the burning of a candle could be restored to its original condition by growing a plant in it this he said was due to the impregnation with phlogiston in the first case and its removal in the second it is very probable he wrote that the injury which is continually done to the atmosphere by the respiration of such a number of animals as breathe it and the putrefaction of such vast masses both of vegetable and animal substances exposed to it is in part at least repaired by the vegetable creation he was unable to explain how this was accomplished he held that all combustible bodies contained hydrogen this was in his view phlogiston the metals contained it and their calces or oxides were simply the metals deprived of hydrogen thus he showed that when iron oxide was heated in hydrogen gas the hydrogen was absorbed and metallic iron formed rich iron slag or cinder was in his opinion iron with some hydrogen retained to prove this it was mixed with the carbonates of the alkaline earths and heated strongly this gave him an inflammable gas and all inflammable gases were hydrogen in a more or less impure condition according to his belief that water could be impregnated with carbon dioxide was found out by him and its use in disease suggested nitrogen dioxide and carbon monoxide were discovered by him but his greatest discovery was that of oxygen gas he examined sulfur dioxide hydrochloric acid and ammonia in the gaseous form these are only the most important of his discoveries inaccurate in his experiments he was decidedly weak as a theorizer he was a firm believer in the phlogiston theory and endeavoured to explain the various phenomena noted by him by means of it the important works of priestley are the following directions for impregnating water with fixed air in order to communicate to the peculiar spirit and virtues of piermont water and other mineral waters of a similar nature seventeen seventy two philosophical empiricism and experiments and observations on different kinds of air seventeen seventy four to seventeen seventy nine experiments and observations relating to various branches of natural philosophy with a continuation of the observations on air seventeen seventy nine to seventeen eighty six and experiments on the generation of air from water seventeen ninety three 
Cotaneously with the three last mentioned British chemists, two eminent investigators, Torburn Olaf Bergman and Carl Wilhelm Scheele, were supporting the phlogistic theory in Sweden, but their brilliant discoveries and observations only served so deeply to undermine it that its dispensation was inevitable. Bergman had acquired such a wide knowledge of the natural science that he taught with eminent success as a professor of physics, mineralogy, and chemistry at Uppsala. He was born in the year 1735 and died at the early age of 49, undoubtedly from the effects of overwork upon a weak constitution. His chief services to chemistry, to which from 1767 he mainly devoted himself, were in the domain of analysis, which he treated systematically and enriched by valuable methods. Bergman's system of wet analysis first took form during an investigation of natural waters, but he later made it embrace the examination of minerals in general, fusing such of these as were insoluble in hydrochloric acid with carbonate of potash. Bergman laid great stress on the analytical value of the blowpipe, between whose inner and outer flame he discriminated, and he endeavored to extend the use of such reagents as soda, borax, and microcosmic salt, substances whose value had been demonstrated by the mineralogist Kronstedt. It is to Bergman's pupil, Gon, that the introduction of cobalt solution as a reagent is owed, and the substitution of platinum wire for the gold or silver used hitherto. Up to this time, reduction of the metallic state had been regarded as a necessary precedent to the quantitative estimation of metals in combination. Bergman now introduced the revolutionary method of combining them in stable salts of known composition, and from the weight of these calculating the metallic content. Bergman's analysis were not very accurate, yet they enjoyed the widest popularity. On the other hand, his German contemporary, Carl Friedrich Wenzel, found little consideration, though his method was similar, and his results more fortunate. Meanwhile, the number of chemists who applied themselves to the quantitative side of phenomena was steadily increasing, an indication of the straits to which the phlogiston theory had been reduced. Yet at this eleventh hour, Bergman set to work to determine the relative quantities of phlogiston in metals. Believing that metals could only dissolve after conversion into their calces, he ascertained those weights of various metals which precipitated the same weight of some other in solution, surrendering their phlogiston to its calx. These weights, to his mind, contained the same quantity of phlogiston. He knew well how to render his chemical experiences useful for the definition and classification of minerals, mineralogical chemistry and chemical geology. The current views upon chemical affinity gained through him precision and clearness. The scientific character of chemistry was materially raised by such observations, and a general survey of chemical processes rendered much easier. His papers appeared originally in the Memoirs of the Academy of Stockholm and Uppsala. Later on, they were collected together and published in six volumes in 1779 to 1790, under the title Opuscula Physica et Chemica. This Latin edition was translated into English in 1784 to 1791. Carl Wilhelm Scheele was born in 1742 in Stralsund, the capital of Swedish Pomerania, where his father was a merchant and a burgess. He was the seventh of eleven children. After receiving his education, partly in a private school, partly in the public school, gymnasium, at Stralsund, he was apprenticed at the age of fourteen to the apothecary Bouch in Gothenburg. In those days an apothecary was in large measure a manufacturer, as well as a retailer of drugs. He had to prepare his medicines in a pure state from very impure materials, as well as to mix them in order to carry out prescriptions, and indeed he himself often, as sometimes happens still, ventured to prescribe in mild cases. 
Scheele's master taught him such methods, and in addition instructed him in the use of chemical symbols in vogue at that date. These he afterward freely employed in his manuscripts, and this renders them exceedingly difficult to decipher. Restricted almost entirely to several old textbooks, together with the fairly good chemical inventory of Bach's shop, Scheele, by constant experimenting, acquired such a knowledge of things chemical that by the time he went to malmo in 1765 he had gained more experience than the majority of the chemists of the time although he was yet only an apprentice at malmo and also in stockholm 1768 to 1770 and upsala 1770 to 1775 he increased his knowledge of the most important branches of chemistry without, however, becoming so well known at the time as he deserved. It was only when, as stated by Nordenskjold, through Gaon, he came into close relation with Bergman, a connection which began in a misunderstanding and coolness, but which developed into a friendship, that Scheele continued to gain steadily in reputation. After taking over the pharmacy at Koping in 1775, he was able to devote himself more closely to scientific work with still more brilliant results the records of his researches followed one another rapidly in the transactions of the stockholm academy into which he had been received as studiosus pharmacie in seventeen seventy five in seventeen seventy seven he published the results of his investigation on air oxygen combustion and respiration at Uppsala and Leipzig, in a volume entitled Chemische Abhandlung von der Luft dans dem Feuer, a chemical essay on air and fire. After his early death at barely forty-four years of age, his collected works were published in two volumes in German by S. F. Hermstadt, Berlin, 1793, under the title Samtlich Physik and Chemische Werk. The Latin edition by Schaefer had appeared four years previous. Although the results of his principal investigations will be discussed further on, it is important to mention here that to Scheele is due the first knowledge of chlorine and of the individuality of manganese and berita. He was an independent discoverer of oxygen, ammonia, and hydrochloric acid gas. He discovered also hydrofluoric, nitrosulfonic, molybdic, tungstic, and arsenic acids among the inorganic acids and oxalic, citric, tartaric, malic, and music, among the organic acids. He isolated glycerin and milk sugar, determined the nature of microcosmic salt, borax, and Prussian blue, and prepared hydrocyanic acid. He demonstrated that plumbago is nothing but carbon associated with more or less iron, and that the black powder left on solution of cast iron in mineral acids is essentially the same substance. He ascertained the chemical nature of sulfuretted hydrogen, discovered arsenuretted hydrogen, and the green arsenical pigment which is associated with his name. He found new processes for preparing gallic acid, either powder of algaroth, phosphorus, columel, and magnesia alba. His services to quantitative chemistry included the discovery of ferrous ammonium sulfate and of the methods still in use for the analytical separation of iron and manganese and for the decomposition of mineral silicates by fusion with alkaline carbonates. The greatest work of the life of Scheele, however, was his memoir on air and fire, which appeared in 1777 and which, on account of its relations to the chemical theory of that time, attracted universal attention, and was translated into English, French, and German. The chief part of the experimental material for this work, as is proved by the correspondence and laboratory journals published in 1892 by Nordenskjold, was collected partly in Malmo and Stockholm, that is, before the autumn of 1770, and partly during the earlier portion of his stay in Uppsala, that is, prior to 1773. These dates are important in view of Scheele's relations as a discoverer to Priestley and Lavoisier. A number of circumstances 
and more especially the dilatorinus of the publisher Swideris, retarded the appearance of the book. From the letters to Gaughan, it appears that the manuscript was sent to the printer toward the close of 1775, but nearly two years elapsed before the work was made public. Scheele, in several of his letters, laments over the delay. In August 1776, he wrote to Bergman, I have thought for some time back, and I am now more than ever convinced, that the greater number of my laborious experiments on fire will be repeated, possibly in somewhat different manner, by others, and that their work will be published sooner than my own, which is concerned also with air. It will then be said that my experiments are taken, it may be in a slightly altered form, from their writings. I have to thank Swideris for all this. However, no imputation of plagiarism was ever brought against Scheele. The whole conduct of his life was proof indeed against even a suspicion of unfair dealing. He was exceedingly unselfish and voracious. To quote Thorpe, with all Priestley's candor and sense of rectitude, he had Cavendish's indifference to fame and his contempt for notoriety. It can be hardly doubted, however, that had Scheele's work appeared in 1775, he himself would have occupied a still higher position in the estimation of his contemporaries, and that it would not have been left to posterity to assign him his true place in the history of scientific discovery. He further expresses the following appreciation. It seems impossible to read this, or indeed any other of Scheele's memoirs, without being impressed by his extraordinary insight, which at times amounted almost to divination, and by the way in which he instinctively seizes on what is essential, and steers his way among the rocks and shoals of contradictory and conflicting observations. It is perhaps idle to speculate on the causes which prevented Scheele from recognizing the full significance of his work. It may be that from the lack of mathematical training, the quantitative aspects of chemistry had few attractions for him but it is equally probable that the peculiar character of his inquiries may have been determined by the circumstances of his position by his poverty and by the want of the refined and costly apparatus needed for quantitative research but surmises as scheele himself said cannot determine anything with certainty it must be admitted that he was wanting in the faculty of coordination grasp of principle and power of generalization that so strikingly characterized Lavoisier, and his greatest investigation, while it testifies to his genius as an experimentalist, reveals no less clearly his weakness as a theorist. But when every legitimate deduction has been made, Scheele's work, with all its shortcomings and limitations, stamps him as the greatest chemical discoverer of his age. His story constitutes, indeed, one of the most striking examples of what may be achieved by the diligent cultivation of a single natural gift. End of section 9. Recording by Lawrence Trask. Mount Vernon, Ohio. InterfaceAudio.com. Section 10 of the Science History of the Universe, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lawrence Trask, Mount Vernon, Ohio, InterfaceAudio.com. The Science History of the Universe, Volume 4, edited by Francis Rolt Wheeler, Chemistry, Chapter 8, Part 1 development of special branches during the phlogistic period. Although the services of the chemists, whose investigations did most toward building up the chemistry of gases, have been referred to, yet the influence of this work in shaping chemistry was so great that discussion of pneumatic chemistry and its relations to the phlogistic theory in more detail is necessary. Boyle, ingenious though he was, was unable to fathom the mystery of atmospheric air. His views regarding it are succinctly stated by him in his Memoirs for a General History of the Air, and in the same work he sums up the views of the ancients. His words are, 
the schools teach the air to be a warm and moist element and consequently a simple and homogeneous body many modern philosophers have indeed justly given up this elementary purity in the air yet few seem to think it a body so greatly compounded as it really appears to be the atmosphere they allow is not absolutely pure but with them it differs from true and simple air only as turbid water from clear our atmosphere in my opinion consists not wholly of purer ether or subtle matter which is diffused through the universe but in great number of numberless exhalations of the terraqueous globe and the various materials that go to compose it with perhaps some substantial emanations from the celestial bodies make up together not a bare indetermined feculency but a confused aggregate of different effluvia his researches however show a marked advance over those of van helmont in the mode in which he collected gases and worked with them at the same time neither he nor his contemporaries felt quite sure whether carbonic acid and hydrogen whose characteristic properties he was acquainted with differed materially from atmospheric air in fact the idea that gases were simply atmospheric air with various admixtures had become fixed in the minds of the chemists the experimentalist stephen hales for example discovered gases and prepared them in a more or less pure state but had no theory to guide him and concluded that it was possessed of a chaotic nature since he failed to recognize his gases as different kinds of matter but regarded them all as modified air black's account of fixed air and its properties is the first example of a clear and logical series of experimental researches where nothing was taken for granted but everything was made the subject of careful quantitative measurement it was not long since hales had announced air to be a chaotic mixture of effluvia black showed that common air contains a small amount of fixed air and that fixed air must be considered as a fluid differing in many of its properties from common air especially in its being absorbed by quicklime and by alkalis it must be remembered that at that time carbon was not recognized as an element and hence though black knew that fixed air was a product of the combustion of charcoal he did not attribute it to the union of carbon with oxygen black held that the change from chalk to lime consists only in the withdrawal of fixed air and that he adduced in proof the changes in weight accompanying the change from chalk to lime and back again a piece of perfect quicklime made from two drams of chalk which weighed one dram and eight grains was reduced to a very fine powder and thrown into a filtrated mixture of an ounce of a fixed alkaline salt and two ounces of water after a slight digestion the powder being well washed and dried weighed one dram and fifty eight grains it was similar in every trial to a fine powder of ordinary chalk the changes referred to are chalk heated equals lime plus fixed air caco3 equals cao plus co2 lime plus fixed alkali equal chalk plus caustic alkali cao plus k2co3 cao3 plus k2o the methods of collecting gases had improved considerably since the time of hales air was ascertained to be a fluid capable of measurement which possessed weight and which could be transferred from one vessel to another just like all other fluids the apparatus which black priestley bergman and scheele employed and those which were used at the present time gradually developed themselves from that of hales joseph priestley was the first to describe the collection of gases over mercury and by this means he succeeded in discovering gaseous ammonia hydrochloric acid silicon fluoride and sulfurous acid gases which had been overlooked so long as water was employed in the collecting vessels as mentioned before 
scheele is now known to have anticipated priestley in the isolation of some of these gases as well as of nitric oxide and sulfuretted hydrogen hydrogen sulfide these investigations along with the recognition of cavendish that hydrogen is a peculiar gas and the supplemental researches of bergman and black on carbonic acid are to be emphasized as being particularly noteworthy since they help to do away with many misconceptions and errors the discovery of so many gaseous substances of such different character naturally roused the chemical world the properties of each gas were carefully studied and after mayow's researches and especially after the more exact determinations conducted by cavendish the density was taken as the criterion of one gas differing from another and from atmospheric air due attention was also given to the greater or lesser absorption of gases by water as a distinct test for some of them bergman for instance determined with fair accuracy the solubility of carbonic acid in water however the exact composition of gaseous bodies remained unknown during this period great uncertainty prevailing even about the simplest of them until lavoisier had pronounced his opinion as to the elementary nature of oxygen and hydrogen but this could not be otherwise so long as phlogiston was believed to be present in most gases hydrogen was thought to be identical with phlogiston by many chemists soon after the middle of the eighteenth century cavendish and richard kirwan setting the precedent for this others looked upon coal as being rich in phlogiston if not as the latter itself and often confused opinions were expressed concerning the composition of carbonic acid carbonic oxide nitric oxide sulfurous acid sulfuretted hydrogen and other gases these opinions being made to conform with the views of the phlogistic doctrine prevalent at that time of greater importance than these views upon the constitution of the gases just named were the long unsettled questions is atmospheric air a simple or a command body and if the latter what are its constituents or ingredients these questions were solved experimentally by chemists belonging to the phlogistic era more particularly by scheele and priestley but it was left to lavoisier to interpret their observations correctly the first observation which assisted in overthrowing the old assumption of air being a simple substance was the deportment of an enclosed volume to a burning body and to metals heated in it the alchemists had asserted that when a substance is burned in the air it is separated or analyzed into things simpler than itself the acute boil had said the process is not necessarily a simplification it may be and certainly sometimes is the formation of something more complicated than the original substance and when this happens the process often consists in the fixation of the matter of fire by the burning substance he was led by his investigations in this direction to the assumption that one ingredient of the atmosphere was necessary to respiration and combustion and that the increase in weight during the calcination of metals was due to a ponderable fire stuff he remarked that it will not be irrational to conjecture that multitudes of these fiery corpuscles getting in at the pores of the glass may associate themselves with the parts of the mixed body whereupon they work and with them constitute new kinds of compound bodies according as the shape size and other affections of the parts of the dissipated body happen to dispose them i have been induced to think that the particles of an open fire working upon some bodies may really associate themselves therewith and add to the quantity boyle the skeptical chemist 1661 he was unable to isolate this ingredient however stahl paid no attention to the change in weight resulting from calcination a position which was taken also by many later phlogistonists who either regarded such a change as accidental or advanced crude explanations of it 
Johannes Juncker, for example, pointed out that the metallic calces were denser than the metals, and consequently heavier. Decidedly an incorrect statement, as Boyle had already demonstrated in certain cases that the calces were specifically lighter than their corresponding metals. Equally ridiculous was the assumption that the phlogiston which escaped in calcination possessed a negative weight, and therefore that the end product was the heavier. In 1630, Jean Ray published a series of essays entitled Essays of Jean Ray, Doctor of Medicine, on the researches of the cause owing to which tin and lead increase in weight when they are calcined. Now I have made the preparations, nay, laid the foundations for my answer to the question of the Sieur Brun, which is that having placed two pounds six ounces of fine English tin in an iron vessel, and heated it strongly on an open furnace for the space of six hours, with continual agitation, and without adding anything to it, he recovered two pounds thirteen ounces of a white calx which filled him at first with amazement and with a desire to know whence the seven ounces of surplus had come and to increase the difficulty i say that it is necessary to inquire not only whence these seven ounces have come but besides them what has replaced the loss of weight which occurred necessarily from the increase of volume of the tin on its conversion into calx and from the loss of the vapors and exhalations which were given off. To this question, then, I respond and sustain proudly, resting on the foundations already laid, that this increase in weight comes from the air, which in the vessel has been rendered denser, heavier, and in some measure adhesive, by the vehement and long-continued heat of the furnace, which air mixes with the calx, frequent agitation aiding and becomes attached to its most minute particles not otherwise than water makes heavier sand which you throw into it and agitate by moistening it and adhering to the smallest of its grains the manner in which ray arrives at his answer is not by any direct experiments on calcination but rather by experiments and the reference to experiments of a purely physical nature such as the discussion of the causes, like change of volume, which can, and of those, like heat, which cannot, produce change of weight. Thus he lays a sound foundation for his method, which is one of elimination, showing that none of the causes to which it had been usual to ascribe the observed increase in weight could be considered legitimate, that it could not be due to the giving up of heat of negative gravity, nor to the absorption of fire matter of positive weight, not to an increase in density, not to the absorption of soot, or of anything else from the materials of the containing vessels. And so none is left unchallenged of all the possible modes of explanation, save that of the fixation of the air. Consequently, his conclusion that calcination of a metal probably consists in the fixation of particles of air by the metal, does not amount to a proof. Mayow assumed that a spiritus igno aeris brought about combustion. According to him, the substance that is being calcined lays hold of this particular constituent of the air, which, however, he failed to isolate. Nevertheless, he approached closely to the correct interpretation of the phenomena in question, the real solution of which was brought forth after oxygen and nitrogen had been prepared with success. Nitrogen was first isolated by Scheele, but Daniel Rutherford, who discovered it independently in 1772, preceded Scheele in publication. Rutherford removed the oxygen from ordinary air by combustibles such as charcoal, phosphorus, or a candle, and having got rid of the carbon dioxide, in those cases when it was formed, by alkali or lime, he obtained a residue, now known as nitrogen. His view of the nature of this gas, in the phlogistic language of the time, was that the burning bodies had given up some of their phlogistic material to the air, which was thus altered. Nitrogen was phlogisticated air, even the incombustible. 
hydrogen too was phlogisticated air but air produced by the union of pure phlogiston with atmospheric air the step taken by rutherford under black's guidance was an advance though not a great one in the development of the theory of the true nature of air it followed from shields as well as rutherford's observations that this new gas which was a non-supporter of either respiration or combustion must be one of the ingredients of atmospheric air the other was discovered by scheele and priestley it should be mentioned here that passages in the early works suggest the possibility of a much earlier acquaintance with oxygen gas hofer in his histoire de la chimie volume two page two seventy one claims to discover traces of a knowledge of oxygen gas in the writings of zosimus a greek writer on alchemy who lived in the third or fourth centuries in a manuscript preserved in the national library of paris entitled zosimus the panopolitan on the sacred art of making gold and silver this passage occurs take the soul of the copper which is borne upon the water of mercury and disengage an aeriform body soma pneumaticon hofer states that we have indications of the production of a gaseous body by means of a red substance the soul of copper which floats on the surface of liquid mercury if this substance is red oxide of mercury the aeriform body must have been oxygen moreover in campbell's hermippus redivivus or the sage's triumph over old age and the grave which was published in london in seventeen forty nine the following statement occurs i could mention another preparation from the vital part of the air itself which is a great secret among these philosophers and is perhaps the white dove so often mentioned in the writings of philolithes of which thus much is certain that when the air is once despoiled of this principle it is no longer fit for animal respiration and it was by a contrivance of this kind that the famous cornelius drebel made that liqueur which supplied the place of air in the machine he contrived for carrying on a kind of submarine navigation this medicine which is as i have said extracted from the air is whiter than the snow colder than ice and so volatile that if a quantity of nutmeg be exposed to the air it is absorbed thereby in the space of a few seconds as bolton has remarked this passage refers to in an unmistakable manner to the preparation of oxygen and its property supporting life drebel fifteen seventy two to sixteen thirty four appears to have rowed in a boat under water in the thames river for a distance of about eight miles and his employment of compressed oxygen gas if it may be so interpreted must have been about the beginning of the seventeenth century scheele prepared oxygen by heating black oxide of manganese with sulfuric or arsenic acid and also from nitrates and from the oxides of mercury and silver and noted its characteristics very clearly priestley who also observed the gas at about the same time without however recognizing its peculiar nature first isolated it for certain on august first seventeen seventy four by heating red oxide of mercury and as he published his results earlier than scheele he has generally been regarded as the first discoverer of oxygen both observed that this gas was capable of supporting combustion and respiration in an intensified degree priestley named it dephlogisticated air and scheele at first air vitriolicus later fire air and also life air the discovery of oxygen enabled both scheele and priestley to recognize air as being a mixture of two kinds of gas priestley calls nitrogen phlogisticated air and scheele terms it spent air priestley employed saltpeter gas nitric oxide as an absorbent for oxygen while scheele made use of phosphorus hydrate of protoxide of iron mixtures of iron and sulphur and moist iron filings 
both made the important observation that upon burning a candle in an enclosed volume of air exactly as much fixed air carbon dioxide was generated as oxygen had vanished notwithstanding all this they did not arrive at the correct explanation of combustion respiration and calcination whose analogy to one another they clearly saw the breathing of animals and the burning of substances were supposed to load the atmosphere with phlogiston priestley spoke of the atmosphere as being constantly vitilated rendered noxious depraved or corrupted by processes of respiration and combustion he called those processes whereby the atmosphere is restored to its original condition or depurated as he said dephlogisticating processes as he had obtained his dephlogisticated air by heating the calx of mercury priestley was forced to suppose that the calcination of mercury in the air must be a more complex occurrence than merely the expulsion of phlogiston from the mercury for if the process consisted only in the expulsion of phlogiston how could heating what remained produce exceedingly pure ordinary air it seemed necessary to suppose that not only was phlogiston expelled from mercury during calcination but that the mercury also imbibed some portion and that the purest portion of the surrounding air priestley did not however go so far as this he was content to suppose that in some way which he did not explain the process of calcination resulted in the loss of phlogiston by the mercury and the gain by the dephlogisticated mercury of the property of yielding exceedingly pure or dephlogisticated air when it was heated very strongly consequently the path distinctly indicated by his own observations was left for another to tread it was lavoisier who was destined to do this as he easily threw aside the trivial phlogistic misconceptions that he cherished at the commencement of his scientific career the others indeed supported a contradictory explanation of combustion and analogous processes in order to remain loyal to the phlogistic doctrine but that it was priestley and scheele who by their exhaustive investigations on oxygen and the part which it played in the processes mentioned furnished the experimental material for the correct interpretation of these and not lavoisier is beyond all question it remained for the latter however to give the correct explanation of combustion calcination and similar processes among the treatises on air which appeared during this period other than those mentioned were bond's meditations physico chimicae de aeris in sublunaria inflexu sixteen eighty five arbuthnot's an essay concerning the effects of air on human bodies seventeen fifty one and cavallo's a treasure on the nature and properties of air and other permanently elastic fluids seventeen eighty one in order to appreciate the advances which the chemical ideas of the phlogistic period showed upon those of the periods already discussed and to understand the connection which exists between the theoretical views of the phlogistonists and those of the chemists of the modern period it is necessary to become acquainted with their views regarding elements chemical compounds and chemical affinity boyle's definition of an element that it is any substance which cannot be further decomposed was one of great significance for the whole of natural science he also considered that the elements attainable by chemical investigation were not the ultimate constituents of matter nevertheless his contemporaries and successors failing to appreciate these views exhibit a tendency to revert to the alchemistic elements and even to those of aristotle for instance lefebvre author of a treatise on theoretical chemistry and lemery classified earth and water with three elements of basilius valentinius and paracelsus while becher held to those three under other names the vitrifiable and the inflammable and the mercurial earths and added water to the list according to stahl's views sulphur consists of a sulphuric acid and phlogiston and a metal 
of its metallic calx oxide and phlogiston therefore the phlogistonists assume that all products of calcination and combustion acids and oxides were elements in which class of substances they also classed phlogiston itself these erroneous assumptions kept back a knowledge of the true elements and only after it was clearly demonstrated that instead of the escape of phlogiston the absorption of oxygen must be allowed and in place of the assimilation of phlogiston the removal of oxygen did that extraordinary genius lavoisier bring light into the confusion which prevailed by his brilliant ideas and observations a better understanding of the composition of substances was gained by analytical chemistry which was gradually developed during this period but although certain constituents of compounds could be identified and distinguished from one another yet the proportions by weight in which substances combined were not considered and consequently the real development of the term chemical compound was reserved for the period of quantitative chemistry the chemists of the phlogistic period were forced to draw their conclusions concerning the composition of substances from analogy notwithstanding which fact however several contributed materially to an insight into the nature of chemical compounds robert boyle for example recognized the dissimilarity of such substances to elements while he mayow and borhave stated that the characteristic properties of substances which combine chemically disappear after such combination notwithstanding the fact that they are still present in the compound formed acids salts and oxides calces were however regarded as being of similar composition and until it was recognized that salts were produced by the combination of acids with bases an achievement of this period the term salt was applied promiscuously stahl for instance applied the term to acids and alkalis as well as to salts proper and considered that salts were made up of an earth and water in 1745 rouet rendered a great service to the study of salts and the diffusion of knowledge respecting this class of compounds in his attractive lectures he defined salts as the products of the union of acids with bases and distinguished normal acid and basic salts and showed their action on vegetable dyes yet he confounded many salts with acids and could not throw off the old idea that the vitriols and other metallic salts consisted of metal and acid bergman demonstrated the falsity of this assumption when he proved that it is the metallic calces and not the metals themselves which combine with acids to form salts after the time of rouet solubility in water and taste were no longer regarded as characteristics of salts inasmuch as he classed several insoluble compounds